The last segment in the unit on rotation is going to be investigating equilibrium. So let's get some basic definitions under our belt and we will be underway. So first review a torque. How about applying, How about applying, applying torque, torque to a little, to a little spud? spud? Let's do that. This is the spud of AP physics after all. So from this point here and at some position on that spud we're going to apply a force. So we have a force applied here and the rotation axis is right there. So looking at the components, vertical and horizontal, we have the perpendicular part of the radius. And then phi, phi is, or theta, theta is the angle between the force and the radius. So that lends itself to our definition of torque, which is R cross F or RF sine of theta, which of course is just the perpendicular part of the radius with respect to F. So R perpendicular times this F here. Now the first condition for equilibrium is making sure that there is no translational acceleration. Sum of F is equal to zero, and that means that's true in the X, the Y, and the Z. And then the second condition is the sum of torques is equal to zero about any given point in question. And if the sum of the torques is zero, it just means the, the counterclockwise and clockwise torques are equal. Or we can also say that the rate of change of angular momentum is zero, which of course is a definition of torque. So to clarify the idea of the center of gravity and gravitational torque, Let's make clear what we mean by center of gravity. I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. Hey, where's the ice cream? Well, no, I don't know if center of gravity has anything to do with ice cream, but definitely I can affirm that this thing needs a big ball of white stuff here. Maybe it's there and you just can't see it on the background white slide. But I do know that I really hate ice cream cones without ice cream. They're just nasty. In any case, this is a good geometric shape for illustrative purposes. And it's of mass m. And this point here is the center of mass, which is also the center of gravity if a certain condition exists. Namely, that if the G field is spatially uniform throughout the mass distribution. And that's usually almost true. So here's the spatial position, radius to the center of gravity. And the weight acts mathematically and specifically, as far as functionally, I should say, from that point. So that's mg, and there's the perpendicular radius r through which we get torque from gravity acting on this object. So the positions of the center mass in the various dimensions are the center mass in the x direction as we've already seen in the past sum of all the mi xi's over sum of all the m's and, and so, so forth, forth for, for the, the position, position of the center, center mass, mass in the y, y direction, direction and, and z, z direction. direction so let's not write each one out that's the form that the center mass takes in each dimension then x center of gravity is simply the same type of form but we've thrown in G. Now I'm assuming G field is constant, so if it's not, I'd have to say GI on each of these. GI. Huh. Anyway, this leads to that the position to the center of gravity is sum of all the weights times radius, in particular weight times the radius, that product over the sum of all the weights of each individual particle in question. And that gives us, leads to, the formula for gravitational torque, which is radius to the center of mass cross mg, and that's basically RCM cross weight. So that is what we will use to consider the gravitational torque acting in a G field, which unless otherwise specified, will be considered uniform. So the W will just be the weight of the object itself. Now, as a practical matter, we're usually worried about torque in one dimension. So, x center of gravity, in that case, is just the sum of all the 
positions times the weights over the sum of all the weights. So torque from gravity is weight from the center of mass because g is assumed constant times the perpendicular radius. Now here's a platform, inclined plane, and we want to do the following. It's, it's time, time to bring out, out a keg, keg of, of nails. nails. Yes, yes, you heard me right. right. And stick it on an inclined, inclined plane, plane where there's, where there's no, no sliding or slipping. slipping. But there may, in fact, be tipping. <laughs> Namely, it might want to tip over. It looks like it might want to do that, right? Well, here's the center of gravity. It's important to note where that is. And to note that that's where gravity acts. And with respect to that, where is the base? The points of contact between the keg of nails and the inclined plane where stability can be offered. And if the line of action does not fall within those limits, we have problems. So if it doesn't fall within these limits here, the problem is if it's outside of the base, the object tips over. Why? Because we have a certain amount of distance between that force and the last point of contact. There's nothing over on the other side to keep this this force now from pr producing a torque that's clockwise, which is going to cause this keg of nails to and spill iron spikes all over the place. And you got to clean up the mess and all that kind of stuff. Hopefully you're you're not stuck in the foot with one of those things. So this can easily be demonstrated. A nice example is take a a board that's sawed at both ends at an angle and I wonder, I wonder if, if I, I can, can hit, hit that, that hole in the board, board at this bottle. Let's, Let's see. see. Yes! That is awesome success. Center of gravity. Center of gravity. Indeed, the center of gravity is crucial to decide whether th this is now going to remain stable. What does it look like it's going to do? Does it look like it's going to tip over you know, counterclockwise or clockwise, or it's going to sit there? Well, there's the line of action in this case. Look where the line of action passes through. If it passes through a point of stability, everything is good. So there's the weight, and it's all about what's going on here. This, this, this is, is interesting. interesting. Let's, Let's look, look at, at a, a magnified view. Let's do that. So there's our magnified view. This is like the width of the board, and this is the thickness. So it's this thickness here that really determines you know, if there's going to be any torque that's going to cause this to tip one way or the other way. Well, there's the line of action, and those dotted lines represent the limits of stability. And as long as the line of action, the gravitational tug, is between them, then any way it would want to tip over, whether to the left or to the right, there are points here which would essentially where that board would catch that attempt. So in other words, pulling down this way, line of action, it tries to tip toward the right. I'm showing it, you know, tipping going clockwise. And there's gonna be a point over here that's gonna of the board that's gonna hit the plant the 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 table that it's on and can provide a torque in the opposite direction to keep it from tipping over. So it's all about the line of action and its relationship to the points of stability that would enable this thing to remain in equilibrium without any net torque acting on it. Let's now do an example where we use the principles of rotational equilibrium to determine the mass of a meter stick that's used as the arm in a balance. And now, here comes a little balance. Isn't it a cute little balance? It's the balance of AP physics. It sure is nice to know that we have such cute little balances in AP physics. And this meter stick has mass m, and this is what we're going to solve for. And, and here, here comes, comes a little 220 gram mass, mass that, that will just, just balance, balance the meter stick, stick about the pivot, the pivot point. point. Well, I'm sure you're glad that we now introduce this little m that's going to balance it. Otherwise, you would have certainly assumed that this thing would rotate down to the floor. And this edge here would bunk right into the floor, which it would. But instead, this mass over here has put it in balance. So the torques are equal and opposite. Now, the center of mass, center of gravity of the meter stick right here, 
is where the force, gravitational tug on the meter stick lies, and it's radius from the center of gravity. It's this distance through this force provides the torque. Now, that takes care of the entire meter stick. Even the amount of mass over on the left side of the pivot point, this amount of material is accounted for by the torque acting from the center of gravity through this pivot point. If we didn't have this mass over here, it would shift the center of gravity over to this side a little bit and we'd be acting here. RCG would change. So all I'm saying is from the pivot point to the center of gravity, the force acting perpendicular to that line takes care of the torque for the entire meter stick. And then we have this force times RW. Now RW turns out to be 19 centimeters when we measure it. Equilibrium condition then is some of the torques is equal to zero, so it means clockwise and counterclockwise torques are the same. So what is the clockwise torque? Or torques? Well in this case from the pivot point, which is what we're gonna what is gonna be our point of reference basically. And we don't need to do that. We could assume it's pivoted at any other location here and it would all work out. But we're gonna pivot it from right here. And then clockwise we have mg through our center of gravity. And counterclockwise we have this force through rw. So let's go ahead and write that out. mgrcg is equal to mgrw. Solve for m. mgrw over grcg. g's go away. We have mrw over rcg. We can now plug in numbers. 220 times 19 over 30 and get the answer which is 139 grams. Now we need to measure the meter stick and make sure it actually is 139 grams. And I can tell you that it is. But you'll probably want to challenge me to actually demo this, you know, real life situation, this real life example at least, as opposed to me just saying, well, yep, it matches our observations. Well, let's make the observations so you can be convinced. Let me finish this video with just one more good torque example where we will predict the weights of two scale readings. Isn't, Isn't it about, it about time, time we, we do a problem, do a problem with, with an iron, iron beam? Haven't, Haven't you just, just about had, had enough, enough of that, that uh, semi-squishy semi -squishy stuff? stuff? Well, of course you've had just about enough of that semi-squishy stuff, but you're going to have to determine to your own emotional, cognitive, and psychological satisfaction when you've had enough of that semi-squishy stuff and in fact just exactly what that means. In any case this beam is 16 pounds and we got the scale L and scale R left and right. These are just bathroom scales. The weight of the beam is acting from the center of mass and here's some goofball coming down from the sky and he's going to land at 2.5 meters. The scales are at 0.5 and 3.5. 2 meters is the center of gravity and this person is at 2.5 meters. Well, let's make that me. I will offer to put my own self at this position, so that'll be my weight. And so the scale readings, weight left and weight right, those are what we're gonna predict. Already, looking at this, I'm showing this one being a little bit more than this side. You could tell why. Should make pretty good sense already to you. Well, the first condition for equilibrium, some of the Weights must be equal to zero. There's no translational acceleration. So scale readings, the up, left and right, have got to be the forces down, which is the beam and me. And so let's go ahead and put some numbers in that we know. The beam is 16. I'm 185, at least somewhere around there, hopefully. So that gives us 201. Therefore, we can say that the left reading is 206 minus the reading on the right. Now we need another equation, so the second condition for equilibrium will give us that second equation. Some of the torques is equal to zero. We'll rotate it about this triangle here, and we're going to consider going counterclockwise, a positive sense of rotation. So let's go counterclockwise first. Weight left times zero plus Weight right, this weight over here, through a moment arm of 3 meters, equals the clockwise torques. Weight of the beam times 1.5, there's 1.5 meters here, plus 
two meters times my weight. So my weight times two. So let's solve for weight of the right scale. And that's 1.5 WB plus two times my weight over three. Plugging in numbers, we get 131 pounds. And so now we can just easily sub this. Supposedly correct reading for the right scale, plug it into this equation and gives us 70 pounds. Of course, we need to measure now and see, look at the bathroom scales. What do they say? Hopefully they will say approximately what we theoretically determined. And I'm sure that you will see that these numbers are very close and thus, <laughs> you just, just got to believe, believe in, in torque. torque.